Hello, everyone. I'm Howard Holton, and I'm here as usual with my my cohort, Paul Lewis. How you doing, Paul? I am awesome. It's another good week. It's a, another good week. Yeah, it's um, it's a con- it's the continuing month of April, October here <laughs> in the midst of COVID. Um, yes. I don't know about you, but but I've started to refer to it as the before time and the now time. <laughs> <laughs> right. When did you do that? I don't know. I did it in the before time. That's right. It's only working at home and then sleeping and then working at home and then sleeping. That is that is now my new life. Yep. Yep. Trying to get out and do some golf before the season disappears. Are you a do you play golf at all? Not a golfer. Nope. As I have I have golfed. I can't say I do golf. Uh, uh, I mean, I golf in that I go to a park that that happens to have a lot of space. I hit a little white ball. Uh, I curse at it. I drive up to it and I hit it again. And I really hope the, the, the girl in the golf cart with the drinks shows up sooner rather than later and with much frequency. I see. Right? You tip her so that it's uh, like an every hole kind of... Course. of- I absolutely. Absolutely. And if I could figure out how to just turn that into a trailer that gets hauled behind my golf cart, that would be ideal. <laughs> But I'm not there to do good at the game. Like, I got over the fact that Titleist wasn't waiting around the corner with a sponsorship years ago. I see. <laughs> I see. So it's a little exercise, a little fresh air, a little getting out of the house. Yeah. Not sitting in front of a keyboard, not sitting on a conference call. You know, you, you kind of, you get to wander and, and see the world. And, and it's, it's nice. And it's, you know, it's fun to watch other people have the same struggles that you do with the silly, silly game. Right. So, let's talk about some interesting things today people might want to hear about. Your thoughts? Um, <laughs> I don't know. You know, why do you drive in a parkway and park in a driveway? I think that's interesting. That's, that's more a U.S. Uh, joke. It doesn't really work in Canada. We only have highways here. You only have highways? Like, do you even, yeah. even drive up to your house on a highway? You don't have boulevards or any of those things? Yeah, but we don't call them parkways. Uh, yeah, it's no such thing. But we do have small highways and 400 series highways, 400 being the set of highways that are the 100, 100 kilometer an hour type highways where versus all the other highways, just because they're numbered, right? Highway 7, Highway 8, Highway 9. Yeah. They're not actual highways. They're just two lane roads. So for those, for those people who are not familiar with the metric system, a 100 <laughs> kilometer highway is 62 miles an hour. That's correct. And for those who are not familiar with the U.S., we don't consider that a highway. We consider that a back road. <laughs> I see. <laughs> like it is, it is not unfrequent that the average speed of traffic on the freeway near my house is 80, 85 miles an hour. Oh, I see. And what's the posted for that? 75. 75. Which would be, I don't know, 8 million kilometers an hour. Yeah, we don't have posted that kind of that height. No, it's impossible. 100. I've seen some 110s. But it is very, very rare. 100 is with the normal 400 series. Yeah. 100 feels like, like we should all be on bicycles doing the Tour de France. Like, <laughs> it doesn't feel like car speed anymore. And I don't know when that, I don't know when that particularly changed. But, but I, would say, um, I would say looking at kind of modern automobiles, modern safety precautions, modern road construction, there's a little bit of a lack of customer centricity in setting the speed limit as such. I see you bridging some content there. <laughs> it's, a new, it's a new one. I'm trying it out for the very first time. How am I doing? I, I wonder what our topic of today is. <laughs> see, I'm not the one that tries to bring it back on topic normally. So I, I just kind of figured I'd try it on for a, a, a chance. Right. The pants are a little tight. I have to be honest. <laughs> see, now, now Denver and Toronto, same kind of weather, right? So... It's less about the safety of the car and more about the snow that's on the road and the black ice that you might encounter. But that's not true of all parts of the US, right? As, as you go more south, the likelihood you encounter those things are small and therefore the speed limit shouldn't be as worrisome, especially in the middle of winter. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, but at the same time, um, like in the US, we have laws that you still can't go faster than is determined to be safe. Hmm. So when it's a whiteout, um, you, you get pulled over for going the speed limit. The speed limit is no longer set, no, no longer 75 because it's determined to be unsafe. And I just think like... Assuming they can see you. 
Um, well, I mean, one way or another, they'll see you, right? If you're going 75 in, in whiteout conditions, they're going to see you because you're going to be you're going to be on the side of the road with a couple of track tire tracks behind you. They'll right. find you eventually. Right. <laughs> it's it's actually one of the yellow jokes, lights, right? Yeah. Uh, we have so many Californians and Texans here, um, and the Texans buy these big four wheel drive trucks. They get great traction in the snow, but the brakes are the same or worse. It's a seven thousand pound vehicle, so. That's right. awesome. Like you can go in a straight line at 90 and you watch them all the time. And then the, the littlest curve comes up and you see them, they just continue to go straight. Like there's two tracks and there is just a, there's just a, a parked four wheel drive vehicle stuck in the snow, 800 feet ahead. <laughs> right. right. And it's like, mm, you know, maybe you should have read the manual before you came here. I don't, you know, we, <laughs> right. we get this stuff called snow and it's actually snow. So customer centricity. I think that's a good topic. Um, we hear quite often, um, but both with things like digital transformation where you wanna change the customer experience, which isn't really customer centricity, uh, but you hear customer centricity in many industries. It might be a technology provider where we have to say, the client comes first and therefore we have to consider their perspective before we determine their offerings. Or it might be in the local restaurant, right? To say, uh, my menu should be reflective of the people who would normally come and buy my product. Um, and therefore I should be able to be, uh, to make adjustments based on where I might put my franchise. Uh, it, I might be in two different states and they might have different tastes and therefore I have to have a different menu to support that. So, if we were to talk about customer centricity, but from a customer's perspective, especially in IT, I wonder if it'd be interesting to talk about what that means. Like if we were a consumer of technology and some vendor to us said, we are going to be more customer centric, what would we expect? Well, so I would start with what, what would we think? And my very first thought is customer centricity seems like a concept that someone came up in the before the before the before times, right. by which I mean like long before the internet existed, something someone came up in a seminar in the 70s, they had a really <laughs> neat idea for it for that one seminar. And then the idea was lost in the annals of time. And somebody was doing a Google search on some recently um, digitized information and went customer centricity, that sounds neat. I don't know what it means, but I'm going to run with it because it sounds neat. That's kind of how I feel about customer centricity. Right? So you're thinking more, more buzzwordy than actual strategy. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. anyone that says we are truly customer centric is lying to themselves right, to some degree. Now that doesn't mean you can't be more customer centric. That, that, and that doesn't mean that I think it's a bad thing. I think it's, I think the opposite. I think it's a very, very good thing. But I think like many things, it has to be customer centricity in practice, not customer centricity in words only. Hmm. Okay. So is it more, it's not binary, it's spectrum. So totally. one can be more customer centric, but one can't be customer centric. That is correct. Because every customer is different to some degree. Right. Right. So customer centric means I think with, from the perspective of the customer, I design from the perspective of the customer. Well, that's great, but even if you hire, even if everyone that works for you, you hire from customers, they're all gonna have a slightly different perspective or only one perspective, right? And so the question becomes, what do you mean by customer centricity? Like what's the definition of customer centricity? What does that mean? And then how do we put that in practice? And I think we tend to start with the practice before we start with the meaning. Right, okay, so how would you define it? What's the meaning to you? There are no wrong answers. I mean, that, and that's, that I think is part of the problem, right? I've never had it defined to me enough for me to say this is the authoritative definition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of weird for me. Um, I probably should have thought about it before we, if, you know, once I heard the topic, because I'm a big fan of definitions. Um, and I think customer centricity varies greatly. But I would start with um, customer centricity has to be able to identify and solve the challenges faced by the customer in a way that satisfies the, the, the root cause need of the customer to begin with. Hmm. I don't know if that's too vague or, or if that's a good starting point. It's a, it's a good starting point. I, I would probably reflect back to you a description that sounds like this. 
Um, customer centricity means however you build, sell, support, and service your offering um, has to be explicitly for the purpose and for the value of the customer. In other words, things like platforms are not interesting to a customer. Things like um, um, uh, marketplace isn't that interesting to a customer. However, um, if I were to solve a specific customer's problem with your in implicit um, solution set that your software delivers on some sort of IT or, or, or business resolution, and that I have a phone number to call and I know who the people are and you've already aligned to the, my buying patterns and you know what my business model looks like and you know who my team are and you know my IT strategy and you know what my currency looks like. All of that is considered in the things you sell. That, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, I would agree on that. Yeah. I, I would say that's a, that's a clear, well thought out double click on, on kind of what I was saying, right? And to your point, yeah. Um, a platform can never be customer centric. Right. A platform is a thing that you build other things on and what you build on it can be customer centric. It doesn't mean we eliminate platforms. It just means we, we actually think about the words that we say and we don't say our platform is customer centric. No, it's not. Right. right? Our marketplace is not customer centric and, and a marketplace can never be customer centric. It's, a marketplace isn't actually bill, built to solve the problem of a customer. It's built to solve a problem of someone marketing to the same customer. Right. Right. Like the SAP marketplace, I'm not sure that they have one, but let's say they do. The SAP marketplace is built for companies who also want to reach SAP customers. It's not built for the customer. And while it may make it easier for the customer to reach those companies, it also doesn't mean that they're customer centric. Like if we go to something that everyone has touched, the Apple App Store marketplace is the opposite of customer focused. Otherwise, there wouldn't be pay to play games. There wouldn't be ad driven revenue, right? All of those things are not customer centric. Right. Right. It would be, it would be full of 99 cent, 199 and 499 games and apps that you pay for once and then aren't bothered about again. That's right. customer centricity, right? What, what is the experience the customer ideally wishes to have aim for that? So that means the very first part of, of becoming or being customer centric is um, spending way more time with a customer to understand them. So have an understanding of their industry, not a deep necessarily, but certainly enough to appreciate where they play in that industry, have a deeper understanding of their business and who their customers are, who their segments are, what their uh, how they make revenue, how they spend money, what their assets are, all those sort of nuggets of a business model, have a better understanding of their IT current architecture and past IT decisions um, and how they spend IT money. And of course, the personal relationships, who you know and how much you know of them, both their corporate and personal desires and all of the, that you know, value of information is applied well before something gets offered is like i see that as step one Le I mean, learn learn before offer i mean times 10 minimum right. times 100 is better times a thousand is ideal mm. right i never ever ever want to base a business off a customer because and as a customer i don't want to buy it that way and right. i shouldn't want to buy it that way Right? If a vendor comes to me and says, hey, we're going to build this bespoke thing for you, and you go, okay, cool, what are you starting with? And they go, um, two, two by fours and nails? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. like we're, not, we're not customizing an existing tool so that it fits your workflow. We're building a tool from scratch. Cool, I'm not interested. Right. <laughs> really, that sounds, that sounds confusing. Why are you not interested? Because you're not going to support it for very long. Right. Like, I'm not a cash cow, and I don't want to be a cash cow. Right. I don't want to have to overpay so much that I could have afforded to build it myself and own the intellectual property. Instead, what I want is I want you to come to me with something that says, hey, we've done an immense amount of research with people as close to you as we can, and yet still define a market. One customer is not a market. I would argue 10 customers aren't a market either, unless those 10 customers are exceptionally specialized. Right. Right. And, and 
Based on the aggregate of all of that, we've built a product that we think accomplishes 90% of what you need, and we have professional services to accomplish the other 10%. Does that sound interesting? That sounds interesting. Because you know what? If 100 companies, big companies buy it, the likelihood that you're going to continue to support it, probably pretty great. Right? The contractual value is probably pretty great. And the contractual obligation, probably pretty great. So what I'm hearing you say is that you can, in fact, be too customer centric. Right. You can absolutely be too customer centric. And I'm pretty sure right now you have at least one company name that popped into your head that's a customer of a company we may or may not work for that right. has you go, we were too customer centric in that case. Right. And I really hope people listening to this have, have had that experience one way or the other because it's until you've had the experience, it's almost hard to go, oh, I totally understand why that experience is true. Because right? you would think like, no, I, like, I really want to be the most important thing in the world. And the fact is, you don't want to be the most important thing in the world. Especially since you're not likely to be the biggest buyer um, and you're not increasing your spend year over year and you're certainly not 80% of the revenue, right? So, and, and if that in fact is true, just buy the company, right? There's no real need to be a customer in that circumstance. Right. <laughs> like, then you're just outsourcing development at that point, right? You're just, <laughs> you're, you're buying into your own innovation. You're spending more money than you need to. Okay. And regardless, like even if it's, even if the possibility is you can't, you can't afford to buy the company because that particular product is a piece of a much larger company. Um, you're still paying someone else for innovation that you could otherwise own. You're still paying someone else to develop intellectual property that in that case, you being the only customer, you're perfectly suited to do. Take that investment and use it to, to increase the value of your own company because you're not actually fulfilling the, the goal of increasing the value of your own company. Sure, you may enable business to happen better or faster, but it's also really likely that it's not innovative business, but rather, but rather evolutionary to what you were, pre evolutionary process to what you were previously doing. So you can be um, less customer centric and you can be too customer centric. So there's somewhere, somewhere in the middle that works. Um, walk me through what you think would be an optimal uh, customer centric engagement with a vendor? What would that look like? What would be the best um, of the best? So, so what that would look like to me is, is a vendor who comes to me and says, Hey, we have a new offering, whether we're, whether that's, we're a new company or we're just adding to our product line, we have a new offering and in doing research about you and companies like you, what we've seen is it's really appealing to your peers. We'd like to have an opportunity to talk to you and see if maybe this can help change the way you do business add a new capability, drastically reduce the cost of an existing capability, enable you to market uh, an existing capability to an audience you could never reach before, whatever that happens to be, right? And then they come to me and they say, so this is our experience. This is what we've seen in however we gather data, right? Whether that's the 25 customers we've sold it to or the 250 customers we interviewed, this is the aggregate result. Like here, here's the design criteria that we used, right? Here's right. Our, our PRD effectively, right? Um, they said the top five concerns were these five concerns, the top five features let's see of these five things, what their workflows look like, look like this. And that resulted in something we feel did a fairly good job of hitting the target. And here it is. Does that match? And is that something you'd be interested in seeing more on? Right. Does that, does that fit kind of how you'd maybe like to see it as well? That fits. That's spot on in my opinion. I, I, I think, uh, you need to come to the table, not only having a better appreciation for what's important to me, but a better appreciation for where I fit in the industry to which I serve. And that might be who my competitors are, but it also might be who, what customers I currently uh, sell to or the ones that I would love to sell to, which do I, to which I currently don't. Um, and then coming to the table and saying, I have an offering that will help you, um, get to the point that you currently can't make with the, your internal capabilities. How can we add to your capability? How can we augment your capability? How could we upskill and reskill your capability based on everything you just said? We've talked to everybody else. We've talked to people in other industries that are like this. We've talked to other countries that are like this and we believe this to be true. And it, and, and I would agree with you. It doesn't mean, you had to have implemented this product in hundreds of different other places and you have the provable answer for that. It's not necessary for that to be true. 
I'm perfectly okay if you've actually done the primary and secondary research to come back with a point of view, a perspective that I'm, I'm likely going to believe in, right? But provide those materials to me too. Like customer centric is saying, you really need to appreciate my corporate and personal goals and then apply that directly in that first interaction. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I want you to do two things. I want you to be more of an expert than you are and tell me you're far less of an expert than you are. And what I mean by that is I don't want to be your only point of research because the thing that I do really well, I use shorthand when I communicate about it. Hmm. I assume when I say we're going to do workflow A, that all of the stuff required for workflow A is already, already in place. And when I talk about it with my team, we're going to assume the low, frang, low hanging fruit isn't there because we don't even see it anymore. We're, we're so embedded with the process. We're so embedded with the requirements, right? Um, and so I need you to not be too much of an expert to say, what do you actually mean by that? What does that actually look like? Can you show me a screen? Right. And, right. and be able to kind of dig into it and, and go, we're going to, we're going to even, even if we just pretend we're going to pretend ignorance. <laughs> Somebody passing you a beverage. Yes. We're going to pretend <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> Um, even if we're not quite that ignorant, just to make sure we're not missing things that are obvious, but so obvious they don't get said. And I've seen that happen a lot before. And then at the same time, um, I want to make sure that you've talked to other customers so that those things that do get missed, they'll probably get brought up in the aggregate. Hmm. Right. And I can't bring myself and innovation through those conversations. Like the likelihood is really low. But you talk to 50 customers, it's also going to be a learning experience on what I've missed and what I'm missing. And it will really help me to go, oh, you know, you're right. That would be a nice feature to have. Otherwise, all I can talk about is the things that I see every day. And I'll never know, you know, I'll never be able to see the forest for the trees. Hmm. So what would be, what would be um, the anti part of that? So in other words, if somebody was coming to me to offer, to create some sort of offer or to, you know, show me their wares and it to be aligned with my desires and needs to grow or change, what are things that would um, not be true? So as an example, um, save money, uh, reduce risk, um, uh, da, 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 grow revenue. Are, are those good enough? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, they're not right. They're they're They've become platitudes. Right. So, so let's, we'll start with the first one. Cause it's the one I hate the most. Okay. Save money. Save that's money. actually not my job. That's, that's, that's not my job. Right. Right. I'd like to lower the cost of, of doing business for sure. Right. But the fact is you don't understand enough about how I spend money and where I spend the money and what my real costs of things are to be able to say that I could save money. Right. Maybe I run exceptionally lean and my efficiency is really high, in which case your 30% savings is a 2% savings. And I already have to spend a ton of money to recognize that 2% savings. I'm probably going to dismiss you very quickly. Right. Right. If you're going to say save money, you better really be behind it. I'm going to pick apart the numbers. Right. To assume I'm an idiot sitting in the chair is problematic and it happens. I would say that's the most frequent thing that happens. Right. And you can't assume you're the first vendor to come in and make that claim. Right. right? Let, let's say you're the third one in and the first two found that savings. Right. And now I'm tight. Right. There's one percent possibility. Yep. <laughs> you don't know that already. That's a problem. Yeah. And you want to be and you want to be massively disrupt disruptive to how I'm currently spending that money, to how I'm currently enabling that business for what I don't consider a valuable return on investment. Right. Right. And if I can pick your numbers apart in, in, a, in 30 seconds of a meeting on the back of a napkin, they're not, they're not good numbers. It's not, it's not going to go well. Um, and so then we move to the second one, reduce risk. Well, reducing risk is actually a legal conversation, not a technical conversation. So again, you better really understand what risk means, what risk entails, and what the quantifiable cost to that risk is. Because the fact is, I already know it, because I accepted the risk when I implemented the thing that, that contains the risk. 
absolutely everything contains risk. There is nothing that is risk-free, zero right. things, right? And so we bet, you better be able to have an intelligent conversation about how do we quantify that, and it better be in a way that actually makes sense for me and for my business. Right? Yep. Now, the third one is by far the most interesting and the most exciting. Grow revenue. Grow yep. revenue. Yep. For two reasons. One, that's the goal of every business. Two, that's how we make more money on the street, increase the value of the business. And three, that's how you make me a rock star within my organization is by enabling me in IT, not in sales, to somehow figure out a way to enable the business to grow. Right. So is customer centric coming into saying, I can help you grow your business or I have offerings that align to your current strategies to grow your business? It's the second one, not the first one. Okay. Right. I mean, the fact is I have a strategy for the year. And so if, if you're, if, if the way that you're going to talk about a product aligns with the strategy that I've already defined to grow the business, it's much more likely that I'm going to be willing to listen. Otherwise what you're talking about is me having to change the strategy of how I'm going to grow the business before we can even have a con conversation about how we're going to grow their business. You know what I mean? Like, like, and it's cool. Like if you want to go, Hey, um, we're thinking about this thing that we're going to release in three years. That's going to be a big help to you to grow the business. We'd like to talk to you about your long-term strategy. And does this fit into that long-term strategy? Cause we're doing some market research. Cool. We can have that conversation. Right. Right. And, and to be honest, that's probably the time for you to find out your strategy doesn't align with your customers at all. Right. Right. Um, but to come in and say, Hey, we have a strategy to help you make more money to help you grow the business. If, if, if your strategy is, I think you should start building cars, right? And, and we build, I don't know, Frisbees. That's, well, while that may be true, I may be able to make more money building cars. It doesn't fit with my strategy at all. Right. Right. So. That being said, it's perfectly okay if you already understand my business strategy to come in and say, I wonder if you added this to your strategy, whether that would help you. But you have to come in already understanding that strategy. You can't that's come true. in with the assumption that I know nothing. Yeah. I, I don't have an appreciation for my business or how it'll change over time. And that you are the miracle worker and you're coming up with an idea I haven't already come to. However, if you come to me and say, you know what? Um, you have a 90% market share in uh, this customer segment, in, um, in, in farmers in the, in the mid East. Uh, and we think that, uh, if you were to change, you, you know, flip the switch and turn this dial on this offering that you provide, you could probably get those same people in the Atlantic coast. I 100%. would sit and listen to that. Absolutely. hundred percent. Hundred yeah. percent. Right. If you're able to come in and say, I understand your strategy. I understand where you sit in the market and based on those things, I think you have an obvious goal of why that's 90% of this, this same goal. And here's the beauty to it and how I can help you achieve that. Right. right? Then you're not talking, you're not talking about me changing my strategy. You're talking about me altering the course of the strategy. It's a very, right. very different thing. And I will also say it's, it's also totally fine to come in and say, I have a way for you to do something you've never thought of within the industry. Like we all have blinders. Right. I don't want to ignore the fact that we have blinders on, and, and bring something revolutionary. Just don't, don't think that you're Jesus walking on water and we're all going to go, Ooh, let's throw some money at you. Right. Right. You have to know that going into it, what we're really going to do is be skeptical. We're, we're going to want to listen, but we're going to be skeptical. And now you're talking about something that is likely much longer term. I have to, there's a lot more due diligence I have to do on something that is wholly new, right. To go back to that second thing, risk then there is on something where it's like, well, if you make a minor adjustment to your strategy, this is the result and, the, and, and it's, a, it's just a, a better focus of your existing strategic initiative. Oh, yeah, okay, I could like, like I own 0% of that market, I own 90% of this market. If the reality is these markets are similar enough that my lessons learned apply over here and I can stop fighting for that final 10% that's impossible and instead just grab a quick 20% of this, oh yeah, I'd much, likely, I'd much rather do that. Right. So, okay. So, so let's summarize again. So rule number one, uh, you can easily be not customer centric enough and easily way too customer centric. Uh, rule number two, come prepared, right? Really that simple. You, you have to come to me knowing me already, not in P 
purest detail form, like you worked for me for 20 years, but way more than starting the meeting with asking me questions. Those questions need to be asked already. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's, so two rules there. What, if we were to third rule one, thir if we were to create a third rule, would it be in about the offering? In other words, now that you um, are at the perfect level of centricity, you've predetermined, you've already done the research, you're coming to the table to talk about the offering. Is there something specific about an offering that is centric or not centric? I mean, I would say an offering that is, that is customer centric requires a defined market. Hmm. And if the customer's not clearly well aware of that market, you need to understand how to define it because we may be skeptical that that market even exists within our industry. Is an offering a product? Mm, not necess not all the time, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily. The product could very well be a platform, right? Right. A platform is not customer centric, but a, but a platform can be a product. Well, I guess my question there is the just, not the product, right? So, does me does being customer centric shift you from offering a product to offering a capability? No, no, I'm always offering a capability if I'm customer centric. I can, a, a product, I don't think a product can be customer centric. Right, that was, the, that was the question, right? Is it, probably not, right? It's not a product, it's not software, it's not hardware, it's not services, it's a capability. It's, it's objectively a change in my business or in my technology, right? It's the outcome of those things, not the thing to which you're selling me in a bill of material. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I would say, I would say on the other hand, though, you probably can't be customer centric if your offering doesn't have products included. In it. Sure. Fair enough. Right? Like, like <laughs> I would say it's hard to be pure consultative and customer centric at the same time. Mm. Cause consulting doesn't really offer a result. It just offers advice. And, right. and, and that's not really customer centric either. Um, I would say there is a component of success that requires outside voices and some of those will be consultative. But if you can't, if you can't then align that to a, a roadmap that includes, that includes uh, work effort and results in a capability, you're, you're, you're probably not what I would call customer centric. You're you centric again. Okay. So number one to spectrum, you can be less or too customer centric. Number two, show your work, right? <laughs> number three, uh, capability is customer centric, not product. And four, the last one, I think you brought up before we even started here, which is you have to be a trusted partner. You yeah. have to have the credibility prior to coming and talking to me. Yeah. I mean, don't think the, so, so I, I kind of put, put, um, put, put people in three boxes, right? Okay. Um, the first box is vendor, mm -hmm. right? Um, or supplier, if you will, right? Um, that's someone where um, I am totally okay if all of our interactions are through RFP, just a straight response, or um, their website, right? Right, right? They're supplying to me products to which I need to accomplish a goal. Right. They're not the equivalent of pencils and erasers. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I, I think of them as widgets. Um, to that accomplish the, the, the thing I need the widget to do to enable me to do the thing I find to be important. I do not find the widget to be important. Right. And at the opportunity to get a, a widget that's as good for a lower price, I'm going to go buy that other widget. Right. And the challenge with that is a supplier constantly has to resell me that they're the right supplier. Right. Right. And they win first by price, second by convenience. And if those two are close, convenience wins. Like I'll pay a little bit more for more convenience. I won't pay a lot more for convenience, you know? Sure. Um, and then the second one is a partner. And a partner is someone that does have influence. I'm, I ask questions to, um, I trust their opinion, but I trust their opinion um, within, with, with very, very, very tight boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I probably have competing partners for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like I may have a storage partner, but the reality is I probably truly have four. Mm -hmm. Right, um, you're not you're not someone that's going to help steer the direction, right? But you you may be someone that I bounce an idea off of. Right, it's right. it's very much 
Um, the most value comes when I call and say, hey, we're thinking about doing a new thing. What do you have that accomplishes this thing? And the thing tends to be fairly well defined, right? We're bringing on a new VMware cluster. Um, we're going full software design data center. We're doing um, converged. Bring me your thing that accomplishes that goal. Um, that's one level above supplier, it's vendor. Mm -hmm. right? At no point are you a trusted advisor because I let you say, hey, did you know we have converged? Right. Right. A trusted advisor is the level above that. Mm. And, and I would say, like, if you're stacking them, right, um, you've, got, you've got supplier that takes up this much space, vendor that takes up this much space, but trusted advisor is way up here. Mm -hmm. Like it's off screen. Right. Right. And I have one. I don't have five. I don't have seven. I have one. Right. And it's for a big chunk of, of what I consider my business to be. So I'm going to use an example. Uh, it's a common example. And it's one that I don't think it's used properly very often. And that okay. is an attorney. Hmm. Okay. Right. You don't have 17 attorneys, Right. but attorneys, there's no such thing as one attorney. Attorneys specialize. Right. right. So you have an attorney. This is my attorney. I have his right. card in my wallet, right? His name is Bob. Right. Um, when I run into legal issues, I don't consult the phone book. <laughs> right. Right. Bob is a real estate attorney. I don't know. Right. Right. Um, I get in a car accident. I don't consult the phone book looking for a personal injury attorney. Right. I call I Bob because Bob. Bob's my attorney. <laughs> and Bob goes, dude, you know, I'm not, I don't do personal injury. And you go, yeah, I know, but you're my attorney. <laughs> right. My expectation is you're going to tell me who you would use for personal injury. And <laughs> right. he goes, that, that I will absolutely do. You call Frank, right? And you pick up the phone and you go, sweet. You hang up the phone and you call Frank and you go, Hey, Bob sent me. And Frank goes, Oh, I love Bob. Bob and I golf together. <laughs> right. What's the problem? Right? right. You don't then go, cool. You don't, you don't tell Bob and Bob goes, Hey, call Frank. You don't go, okay, but I'm going to ask my cousin. <laughs> it's all right. Right. You go, no problem. I need two I'm, more referrals. Right. I'm calling Frank right now. You don't then Google it. You don't go, but, but I found Larry H. Parker, like his commercials are great. <laughs> right. Should I use Larry H. Parker? He'd go, what? what? No. Why, why did you call me? <laughs> That's right. like, like if you're not going to take my advice, we have a different relationship than I thought we did. <laughs> right. Right. In the same way you call and you go, Hey, um, I'm going to get a divorce. Who should I talk to? You want Ann, no doubt. And you don't, you don't then cross shop. Right. Right. If you're cross shopping or if you're cross shopped, you are not a trusted advisor. Right. Those two things don't go together. Right. It does not mean that you can do everything. But what it means is within the context of what you do, the customer calls you about everything. Hmm. And when you give them advice, they take the advice. They may not act on it hundred percent, right? The, the, the attorney kind of uh, requirement falls apart when we get into things like technology where, you know, you get 350,000 products that end up in a data center. It's not necessarily given that you're going to be able to handle the complexity that easily every time that you'll be able to necessarily recommend someone every time. Mm -hmm. But a trusted advisor means they come to you, they take your advice and they go there first, period. Right. And they'll probably call you and go, hey, I, like, I really appreciate it. That was, a, that was a nice company that you sent, but I don't think I explained myself well. What I actually needed was this. Oh, yeah, that actually doesn't work. <laughs> right. And, and you have to be able to be confident enough to go, yeah, I don't do that. And the customer not do that. Right. Or that's not really what you want to do. Do this instead. Or... Um, you read that article in Harvard Business Review, didn't you? Oh yeah, that yeah, that's where my CIO saw it. He put the magazine on, or he sent me a link, or whatever. Right? Oh yeah, that's actually like that's really kind of marketing fluff. Um, as far as we've actually got in the industry is this, and we're probably three to five years away from from doing that. Um, how about we get together in like a year and take a review of the industry? Right. Those are the things and the actions and the the discussion of a trusted vendor. And so if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I had a trusted vendor and they don't do these things, it's not a trusted vendor, it's just a partner. Right. Right. It's not a trusted advisor, sorry, it's just a partner. So if I were to sort of summarize that in a sentence, so a trusted partner or trusted provider is someone with the willingness to provide advice or solve a problem, 
even if in fact they don't have the solution to do so. And the trust is there. Yeah. You trust them to give advice that's the best for you, not the advice that's the best for them. Even right. in the case that they kind of do it, if they're not the best one for you, they'll recommend someone else. Right. Those are the things that a trusted advisor needs to do. And I, I, I hate to say it, but a trusted advisor is not a company. A company cannot be a trusted advisor. A whole right. vendor cannot be a trusted advisor. A partner cannot be a trusted advisor. A trusted advisor is a person. Right. Right. You don't call the front desk of your, of your attorney's office and say, hey, whoever you got on the floor is who I'll take. <laughs> right. The next available. Right. You're not a client of the firm. You're a right. client of the attorney who is part of the firm. Right. Right. Like, like, and, and in the same way, if you would call anyone at the company, again, probably not a trusted advisor. Rather, you call one person who will connect you with the right person at the company or the right person externally, that might be a trusted advisor. So then one would say that a company can't be customer centric. The account team is customer centric. I mean, I would say yes and no, right? Okay. Um, I would say if the account team isn't customer centric, the company can't be either. Right. But if the account team is all that's customer centric, then it's also not customer centric. Fair enough. Right. Like it's a, right. it's a, it's a, in, in that it's a scale from not customer centric at all to entirely too customer centric that that works throughout all of the processes, right? Like, like everything also has to be customer centric. Right. right. So how does a customer, how is a customer going to consume it has to be a question that's asked. Right. And if it changes, how do we deal with the fact that it changes? which we've seen, right? We, we've seen it with, when we went from CapEx to leases and now we've gone from leases to as a service or consumption models. Yep. Right? So, so if, if, if I call myself customer centric, but I don't offer my customers a way to procure that aligns with how they procure, not customer centric. Right. right? I would also, I would say the number one thing for a trusted advisor is you control, you influence and control 100% of the wallet share for the thing that you do. Mm. Right. So I may not receive as an attorney, I may not receive, I'm not an attorney, but if were I an attorney, I may not receive a hundred percent of your legal spend, but the percentage that I didn't receive, I would influence where you spent it and who you spent it with. And that's a really, really important thing. And I will get a hundred percent of the services I actually perform. That is correct. Right. That is correct. Again, if, 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 if I'm in a bid situation, Right now, there are exceptions. Um, there are agencies and organizations that must put things out to bid regardless of the advisor status. Right. At the same time, you could also argue they don't really have trusted advisors. Right. Right. Like they don't. They they're not enabled to have that kind of relationship. Governments, it's very hard to actually to have a true trusted advisor relationship with. Right. And when you do, those things tend to be long-term budgetary items that include a vote. Right. <laughs> Right, like you made the Boeing made the line item, or Halliburton made the line item. Right, Congress right. is actually saying there's a, a bunch of money set aside for these things. Right, so trust advisor equals lobby. Um, I mean, trust trusted advisor equals the CEO knows who you are. Right, right equals you've been you, your name gets brought up to the CFO, and the CFO goes right, right, we have that line item. Right, right, like like those are things that that I think trusted advisor requires. Um, you know, so it, it, it does become complicated. It's something that I see overused. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try to become a trusted advisor. That really should be the goal, but it does mean that you, that you can't be flippant about it. Right? Right. We go golfing three times a month. That doesn't make you a trusted advisor. <laughs> right? um, and the fact that you're friends with, with one side or the other of the equation also does not make them a trusted advisor. Right. Well, I think we had a good chat on this topic. We've uh, defined a little bit more. We narrowed it down into four or five statements. I think that should help you when you're, when you're considering this customer centricity things. I agree. I think I, regardless of which side of the equation you're on, right? You, could, you should be able to look at that and say, hey, am I customer centric? And how do I think my customers actually see me? And, right. and hopefully you're, you're smart enough to look at that and be introspective and say, well, I have eight customers. They see me in a variety of those buckets, not all just in one bucket or the other. 
Right. And is this what I want to be and who I want to be and how I want to be? And then how do I change it going forward? Right. Awesome. Another good conversation. Well, I think this is great. If we missed anything, if, um, if you think we were wrong, we, we read all the comments. So please, by all means, comment. Feel free to call us out. It's no problem. We're happy to address it. And as always, if there's like something you'd like to see uh, us discuss, um, let us know in the comments. Shoot us an email. You know, smoke signals. I don't, I don't read them very well, but give it a try. <laughs> you never know. Um, and whoever's sending the smoke signals here in the Rocky Mountains could probably knock it off. No one can read them. <laughs> All right, y'all. Have a good week. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye.